So I think the first place to start is um, what are we solving for in market selection? Um, and broadly our idea of market attractiveness is expected, expected lives in new geographies trading off um, the cost of getting those lives and the pricing risk of getting those lives. And we can double click into, we'll double click into each one of those three buckets. Um, but broadly expected lives, I think it was market size, network attractiveness, payer competitiveness, product fit, um, pricing risk, we'll just do that for now. Uh, cost is entry cost and operating cost. Cool. Okay, so jumping into expected lives. Um, the bucket we have here, my page is a lift, excuse me. Um, market size, I think, is pretty self explanatory. We care about you know, individual lives in a given market that we're considering. Um, if expected lives is market size times share, the remaining three buckets are the things we think about as what will dictate how much share we'll get uh, in a given market. When, we, when you show the number of individual lives, is that on X or is that some estimate of on X plus off X? Yeah, our estimate is actually on X plus off X times historical effectuation rates. What's that? On exchange. On, on, exchange. Exchange. on exchange. Plus an estimate we have for off exchange, which is the most granular, plus what we actually think will uh, keep. So I think the effectuation rate is like 0.85. Do you know where that uh, the off X estimate comes from? Yeah, there's a, a guy named Mark Farah who produces off X. Um, rough off X numbers uh, annually. Treat with extreme suspicion. <laughs> and it's not it's not granular, it's just on a state level, I believe. Yeah. So you kind of broad brush assume that every county has the same off X population. Um, so not yeah, not the best, but that's what we're doing. And it varies from state to state how significant it is. I think across the board it's probably around thirty percent. Um, okay, so that's market size. Um, and then the other three buckets are share. So <clears throat> probably the biggest driver that we know of share is, is within network attractiveness, uh, premium position. Um, so a cheaper plan relative to the market will sell more. Um, network breadth is very important. So a broader plan relative to a narrower plan will sell more. And perceived quality, um, particularly if you have what's perceived to be the premier system, the premier group of doctors in your network, um, that will sell more than a network that doesn't have those things. <laughs> okay, but at this stage we don't know who we're most likely to go with, right? So we just kind of toggle between options. Um, so, th yeah, that's right. So, a separate thing is what factors we actually can estimate in the market selection process. Um, and some of those things will we'll get more information on those things over time. Um, but this is just the kind of universe of um, what would dictate share. More so than we actually have all the data points at this point. Yeah. Um, and for, for future for future use cases, um, you know, maybe those are things we can do more extreme. Um, and the other thing I would call out is we don't necessarily have the clearest sense of the weight of each of these factors. Um, so it's based more on intuition and people's experience here than you know we know that network threat is you know five percent of the share. I don't know. I think we got a pretty good sense though for the individual market. I mean, we know that premium position trumps all. Not, not in a quantifiable way, I guess my name. Uh, I would, I would dispute that. I, okay. I mean, I don't know if we've done that, but certainly in the previous, like in my last, past life doing consulting projects, I did a bunch of like segmentation surveys of consumers uh, for the individual market. And if you ask people what their stated preferences are, like the top, Five things are premium, 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 deductible, and um, like it's overwhelmingly premium that drives behavior. And I think the analysis of premium position versus market share bears that out pretty strong. With you know breadth and perceived quality being a distant second to third. Fair enough. I have no doubt about that. Even if I can't give you the exact percentage. Um, okay, uh, fair points. Um, the next two buckets, which um, aren't as big of factors, um, but just for the sake of comprehensiveness, um, payer, competitiveness, pay, payer competitiveness, so the, the number of competitors 
is significant in a market where there's 10 competitors versus two, you should expect to get more share when there's two. Um, the diversity of networks, so if there are a series of narrow networks that are already out there, it's harder for us to come in and be diversified. And then there's you know, some, level, some level of structural advantages to, to payers who are um, incumbents in the market uh, to varying degrees, but the, the strong example would be someone like Florida Blue who has captive brokers, and that makes it much more difficult for us to get lives in that market. Um, the last bucket, which is particularly small and individual, but again, for the sake of confidentialness, um, product fit. So there are certain consumers who might just not want an EPO, and, and the example is California, where consumers are very used to HMOs. If we were to sell a EPO product, does that make us more or less attractive in that market? And that's um, something we don't really consider as much in, in individual, but is some degree of a factor. I, I would also add here that, although we won't talk about it today, all of these relative weights change drastically for small companies. It's like the same set of factors, but they're a different set of weights. Uh, okay, so if we're good on that slide, the next big bucket that we consider in in market selection is the cost. So the, the entry costs we're particularly sensitive to because we only have so much time to go execute on a variety of markets, um, and so we're trying to optimize for entry cost. So the regulatory piece of the cost is, um, to give you an example, like Tennessee and Ohio, where the regulators don't really ask for anything on the network side. They just say, if you want to sell here, cool, go ahead, versus a California or a Michigan where they have extensive requirements for you to go through. It's much more difficult for us to, to get into Michigan and, and California than Tennessee and Ohio. Um, and then the kind of outreach facility contracting, physician contracting is, how many different providers do we need to make this network work? Work and you know we only have so many um, so many people to go do that. So we would prefer places where we can do less outreach, do less facility contracting, do less physician contracting to get to the same number of lives. Cool. And then operating cost is probably a broader bucket if we had more visibility into the rest of the organization and what they deal with to um, to operate in markets. But we broadly think of this as the regulatory environment. So uh, California, where DMHC is known to be a quite persnickety regulator and you know, dig into everything that we do on a frequent basis, is a kind of painful place for us to operate. We have to hire people just to be in California to satisfy them. Um, and then provider specific requirements, particularly with like a lease network, um, it just causes a lot of organizational pain where we can't do the things directly that we typically do. So a member has a complaint in New Jersey, you know, we can't go talk to the doctor directly, we have to go triage it through wall care, and that just becomes a difficult process for us to operate. Cool. Um, pricing risk. So basic idea is if we go into this market, you know, what is the likelihood that the, the population that we get will be um, sicker than we expected it to be going into it? Um, so that's kind of two buckets of market risk. What is the, what is the likelihood that the market, the market morbidity year over year moves faster than we expect it to. And so those are kind of determined by, or we can proxy that that risk through you know, market MLRs. <coughs> if everyone's getting 100 MLRs, it's probably a bad place to be. Premium trend, if rates are going up 20, 30% year over year issue. And you guys get the point. And then the other level of this would be adverse selection. So what is it like if the population we get in particular is worse than which is driven primarily by the network composition, so this percentage of excellence, and, and the also kind of interacts with price position. Cool, are we good with that? Okay, so then just quickly before we go into the process, high level of what the market selection process looks like, is we do a market screen to see what are the markets that we'd be interested in going into, then we do provider outreach to try and engage those people and see if people are interested in working with us there. And then we take those two inputs together and we come up with um, we come up with our our final markets that we try and get market approval in. And then just to call out that about 50% of markets will drop out between steps one and two and steps two and three. Okay. So um, wanted to just focus on market screen here and then in the next
next time we get together, we'll do the provider outreach part. Cool. Okay, so um, for context, I wanted to start with what the approach was in for 2019 expansion. Um, I think it's useful for us to know like what what was, and also people around the organization will ask frequently about the market scorecard and where is that and what's going on. So I think it's useful context to have. Um, their approach was slightly different. There was a bigger weight on unit cost competitiveness, as you can see there, which was thought of as a composition of relationships, uh, provider and payer dynamics. Um, they had a factor called marketability, which we don't really have. Um, and then there was a bigger Sorry, was weight on operating costs. So this was the approach that was used um, for a 2019 expansion. So this was a model built by Nick Reber, Victoria, Kogi, um, um, so, slightly different picture, just to call out what some of the differences are, I don't want to dwell on this one too long. Um, primarily, they were using this model to estimate profitability, where we're using our approach to solve for just expected lives, so slightly different there. Um, they had an effort to estimate youth cost advantages in a different way, so the value of relationships um, and the degree of monopoly or pay on the payer or provider side. So now on the provider side suggested them that there was no ability to get a new cost advantage. Um, there was an operating cost estimate that you know actually plugged in a variety of things like broker fees and premium taxes. Uh, a regulatory score was demerit to operating costs. And then marketability, they didn't really get too much into, but was some estimate estimate of you know the sales channel. So if there's interest, here's a reference to the broader conceptual framework, which has some interesting nuggets in it, and here's, an here's a reference to the actual scorecard itself. This is the 2019 version? This is yeah. the 20, this is 29, it was made in 2017, right. or 2019. Or 2019. Yeah. Has there been any work to look at like what this would have produced for markets where we have outcomes? And therefore, how good it is? Um, no, it, it hasn't, but that would be interesting to do, because there are markets that we're now launching it that we're going to launch. So we don't have any results there, but that would be interesting. Um, yeah, if you have other questions on this, I'm happy to walk you through it to the extent I know. I'm frankly not the most convinced yeah. by the output, but. Um, yeah, I, I haven't actually looked at it in detail, but like how um, far was that it was a little bit over-engineered, uh, given the robustness of the inputs. Like, or the lack of robustness of the inputs, like, it's a lot of model to process pretty weak. Yeah, I mean, hence the question about the feedback loop. The market's where we have outcomes. Yes. Um, but for 2020, we went in a very different direction, and I would think the longer term state is probably somewhere more in the middle. Yeah. So, the 2020 approach was much, much more of a qualitative rank, looking at each market on market by market. Basis and then having you know conversations of where where we think we should prioritize. Um, and the other the other framing is that we expect to get new lives from three buckets: so very large MSAs, exist, expansion with existing partners, and expansion from inbound interest. And the only ones that we really screened, where we went through this process of like proactively looking for people that we want to talk to and markets that we like, was in this large MSAs bucket. And the other two and three we evaluated on that. Okay. So I wanted to walk through the large MSA approach um, of what we did for 2020. Okay, so the first step was let's just take a cut. How many markets are there that you know could yield around 10,000 lives in year one if we really crushed it? And so we screened for markets over 45,000 lives. There's 57 of them in the country. We're already in. 12, we can talk about the counting, but whatever, let's just work. We're already in 12. And then there's a couple of them that we just don't think are feasible. So Pittsburgh, which is dominated, Boston, where you know, people are pretty advanced, yeah. So we just cut out a couple of those. And so we're left with the universe of 42 large embassies. And the, and the, the 10,000 approximate assumption is built on 45,000 lives that we could take, about 20% if we were the lowest. Um, and the other thing I probably may call out is there's an open question of how 
how, how much how much more value can we actually extract from putting more investment into the market screening process if the universe of places we're considering is now important to. Okay, so that was the first step. Um, wish that list was longer. Uh, so the second step is um, building out competitive landscapes for, for all of those markets. And um, the competitive landscapes, this is the concept that I would want to spend more time on, um, kind of gives us a variety of information. So it tells us how many competitors there are, which we know to share. It tells us what networks are already built, if there's space to differentiate. But most importantly, it's our best proxy so far to understand what providers want volume and are willing to give us lower unit costs to, to get it. And then the unit costs will pass through the premium position, which will pass through to share. So if that works for everyone, I wanted to go through two quick examples to kind of illustrate that point. Um, Las Vegas, uh, you only have two competitors and HCA is cut out of the market. They're not getting any volume. That is a strong signal to us that they would trade unit costs to build a product with us and get more volume. Um, contrast that with Chicago. You have six different networks. All the major players have their own product. And then you have one, one, broad, one or two broad products. So the ability for us to differentiate, for us to carve out a player, um, to give to offer more volume in exchange for lower unit costs is a is a harder sell to make in this market. Okay, so this leads me to um, this guy, which is my general frame for looking at competitive landscapes and trying to estimate who wants volume. So bear with me for a second. Um, a provider's volume in the individual market is a function of how much share of the individual market is the products that they're in getting. So that's the left network share of the market. And then how much share of that network is the provider. So the most volume you could get is a product with a crap ton of volume relative to the market, and you are a huge part of that network. So that's the bottom left here. If you're in a cheap, exclusive network, we think you're getting a lot of volume. The top right is you're in an expensive, broad network, or you're cut out, you're not getting much volume. Cool. So that segues into this guy, which is our strategy to enter markets, is to find providers in buckets one, two, and three, quadrants one, two, and three, and build products with them in, in, in bucket four. To the extent that we can. To the extent that we can. But in practice, we might end up having to move. Um, and I think there's an interesting question of is it better to find a provider in bucket two or a provider in bucket three? And I think there are counter arguments going both ways. But for example, going back to the Chicago example, I think our best play in Chicago right now is to take you know this guy, take the advocate who's in an expensive, exclusive product, and try and push them into a less expensive exclusive product, but who knows if they have the appetite for that? And the assumption is that they're not getting much volume because of the price position, but you really don't. But yeah, I mean, it could be that their brand is enough. Their brand plus the BCBS brand is enough to make that a viable product. In which case, why would they want to cannibalize their own business? On the other hand, if they're not getting a lot from it, they can lower their unit costs a little bit. We can come in and get a lot more volume, and they'll be getting. So, great segue. The caveats to this volume assessment. One, premier systems should get volume at a higher price point and in broader networks. And so an example of that would be our Cleveland Clinic product. We're the only one with Cleveland Clinic in network and we're think, the most expensive in the market, but we still have close to 15% share. Um, and then the second caveat to that is providers getting a lot of volume may still at a competitive price point, might still cut us into the market because they want to diversify their pairings and have a little more leverage. Cool. So one other thing I want to hit on competitive landscapes. Um, the other insights we can glean from these pictures is something around network adequacy. So Tampa General Hospital in this picture is in every um, is in every network. They only have one hospital, so they're not there for the breadth. 
there's a suggestion that you might need to have a general to be adequate in this market, and that's why everyone has them. Um, on the other hand, Florida Hospital is cut out of this market, so that's a clear picture to us that Florida Hospital is not necessary for us. Um, the other thing you might be able to glean from this is you know, who is cheap. If someone is in all products, there's also a bit of a suggestion, or it's possible that they're in that product because they are cheap and they bring down the average unit cost of that product. That's a suggestion as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the general backdrop for this is like this is the market screen. This is us taking our best guess from you know, publicly available data. A lot of this plays out once we actually start engaging. Okay, so once we have competitive landscapes, we have some kind of sense of who wants volume, what the networks look like in each of these markets. The next step for us is to think about um, which providers we can build adequate networks with. And we do this by making market maps for all, for all of these different places. So if you look on the left hand side, the shaded parts of where the people live. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, you have, in the Tampa map, you have HCA and, and Trinity are kind of covering broad parts of, of the, both of these counties and it, where the people where the people live. So those are kind of two options that you think might be able to, to cover um, this you geography. Have decent data at this stage. Uh, this yes, this is fine. So we're only proxying facility coverage. And you're assuming that you'll get the positions, which is not necessarily a fair assumption, but it's the best data that we have. But the like where the facilities are and what the where the people live and what the geography looks like is basically perfect data. And, and the people living is just based on the census information, right? Which is proxying that's where people can sign up where they live. Yes. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, contrast that with the one on the right, where you have these massive geographies and you have four different systems. Uh, and all of them cover like a little piece of the geography. Um, so very different, very different network built there. And so what what are we actually looking for? What is attractive to us in these market maps? So we want we're looking for we're looking for markets ideally where there are fewer providers uh, who are needed to build an adequate network, and that speaks to the entry cost. That is less contract than you have to do to stand up a network. Um, the other thing we're looking for is more permutations of adequate networks. So if there's a lot of different providers who can get you there, then there's more ability for us to build a differentiated network. And finally, the whole derail is you want to overlap you know, providers with broad footprints who can give you an adequate network, and you want those same providers, ideally, or providers who want volume who aren't getting much in the current in the current landscape. Okay, um, so that's the market map piece. Um, the, the next two pieces aren't done with the greatest level of precision, um, just given where we're at in the process. So the entry cost, we really only looked at relationships. So do we have an existing relationship with providers in the market? Um, here's a reference you guys are interested of how we scored of probably 300 different systems. And the basic idea is, will our relationship you know, either make it easier for us to contract and build a network or does our relationship potentially give us an advantage on getting lowest unit costs? And then the next entry cost question was around filing requirements. So if we're already operating in the state, it's much easier for us to expand in the state than having to get a new license. And does the state kind of have a reputation for being very unfriendly places for businesses to come in and enter? And so an example would be like Washington, where they're notoriously um, homers and only like people from Washington. Okay, um, the, last, the last thing we looked at, again, not the greatest level of precision at this point, is um, two flags around risk and operating costs. So do we have any anecdotal knowledge about this market being um, a really risky place to operate, or, or there's a lot of you know, risk in the population? So an example would be like Iowa, where everyone knows that there's um, a teenager with a very poor, rare form of hemophilia who's on the individual market, and costs over a million dollars a month in <laughs> medical expenses. If you were to be adversely selected by this teenager entering Iowa, um, your business would be blown up. So, you know, okay, let's stay away from Iowa. Um, and then on the operating costs, similar anecdotal knowledge about what are states that are really difficult to operate in. So we know California is a difficult operating environment. We know that Washington is a difficult operating 
environment, let's be careful about sign up for those things. So that all rolled up into this qualitative picture, um, ranking all of these markets on on those base on, on those bases, and, and it wasn't um, it wasn't there was no math to this. This was just a conversation. Let's put all the ingredients together and see what we think is most attractive. So that's basically what you took us through the other day, right? How you talked about it. Okay. So that's that's what I got. And then the next time we'll do um, we'll do provider outreach.